Go to Hebrews, the third chapter, if you will, please. Hebrews, the third chapter. I know you have your Bibles with you. Hallelujah. This really has a lot to do with what I've been speaking about lately, the coming panic. Hebrews, the third chapter. Let's read the first six verses. If you're ready, I'm reading from King James. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he hath builded the house, he that builded the house hath more honor than the house. And every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if, 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 we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing the hope firm unto the end. Heavenly Father, I pray that you speak clearly in me, to me, and through me. I pray that everyone that came to this service this afternoon will be moved towards you. Lord, that we will be quickened, that we would obey the word of God. The word of God would not go in one ear and out the other. We would not be looking into the mirror and then walk out and forget what we saw. Holy Spirit, anoint me, come upon me, let the truth of God find its mark in our hearts. For I want this message to go deep into my heart so that I can't just shunt it off. I want it, Lord, to lay hold of my heart that it really changes the way I think. Lord, we have to be reminded constantly of this thing that I talk about this afternoon. Lord, we, we have to be constantly taught and, and reminded of this, lest we slip back into fear and unbelief. God, speak clearly to us now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On this, this chapter of Hebrews, uh, the writer is talking to us about two houses, the house that Moses built and the house that Jesus is building. And the entire chapter is a warning that those who believe that they are part of the house of Jesus do not revert to the unbelief in the house of Moses. The house of Moses fell through unbelief. The house of Jesus, the Lord declares, will not fail because of unbelief. God said that his son is going to build a lasting house, and the gates of hell will not prevail against that house. Hallelujah. Now, Moses, the builder of this wilderness house, the Bible says, was faithful in all things. He never once wavered in his faith. And yet only he and Joshua and Caleb, three, according to the scriptures, maintained their faith. All the rest who came out of Egypt died with hard hearts full of unbelief. For 40 years, the house of Moses grieved the Lord, the scripture says. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. The Holy Ghost said, I was grieved with that generation 40 years. They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. For 40 years, they never knew God's ways. For 40 years, they erred in everything they did. God's saying, for 40 years, they provoked me to anger, to indignation. Now, now, folks, when I read that, I say, Lord, I don't even want to grieve you for an hour. I don't want to ever grieve you. How could people have grieved you for 40 years? They gave him lip service. They, they, they went through all the uh, motions of worship. They went to the tabernacle. They offered their sacrifices. But what they did was so sinful that God says, I'm going to tell the whole world. He tells us. We read of the unfaithfulness of this whole generation. We read it now. God holds it up to our faces so that we can see it as an example. The Bible says their hearts were hardened by unbelief. All their expressions of faith, all their talk about believing and trusting God was all in vain because they had no steadfast confidence in God. It was never built strongly. It had no foundation they, they, they drifted in and out of a superficial kind of faith 
and confidence in the Lord, but they never did set their hearts to trust God. You know, Hebrews, the third chapter, is an admonition from the very heart of God to the house of Jesus. He says, take heed, learn from their failure, exhort one another daily, don't depart from faith like they did. Don't depart. No, you know, I, I, I've been thinking if, if we could somehow, if we could take one of us, uh, I don't know if I want the job, but if it were possible just to think of taking somebody from uh, this century, from the 1990s, and project you back in that time and place, and, and you're there in the wilderness, now you're dressed just like they are, and, and, and somehow you just get lost in the crowd and they think you're one of the uh, uh, people that came with them out of Egypt. And you, you get to the camp just as they have come out of the uh, Red Sea experience and they've been dancing and the tambourines have been playing and they've been talking about how great God was, who's like unto the old Lord, glorious in holiness, fearful in praise, doing wonders. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. You will guide us in your strength. Thou shalt bring us in and plant us. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Glory be to his name. You've just heard them sing and dance because they'd seen Pharaoh and his army drown in the sea. They'd seen this great miracle. And now you followed them three days later, and there's no water, and they're at a place called Mara. And everybody is thirsty. The children are quiet crying and the mothers are concerned and the fathers are concerned because there's no there's no water, there's no sign of water, there's not a drop of water anywhere. And suddenly someone comes running from the edge of the camp and cries, water, water. And so you see the the husbands of the wives getting their water pots and running toward this little body of water, this little pond. Everybody's excited as if well, maybe God has answered prayer. And you go along and you get there and you hear an awful commotion by the side of the water because people, the men are spitting out the water and women are spitting out the water. And now there's an anger and some are cursing and saying, you can't drink it. It's poison. It's poison. Don't touch it. And thirsty people can't believe it. So they dip into the water and taste it. And everybody's spitting it out and everybody... Is, is complaining, and they send a delegation to the tent of Moses. And the, the word is incredible what this, you, you already know the story, but here you are in this camp. And you know the story, you know the faithfulness of God because you're from history. You can't believe what they're saying to Moses. They're ready to stone him. They're saying, you're a killer. Why would God bring us out here and abandon us? Why would God allow this to happen in our lives? Doesn't God care that our children have no water? That we are, we are going to literally starve to death. There's no water. Moses, we thought you had a backup plan. You had no plan. You have no plan at all. God has no plan. And you stop a crowd and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. God just opened the Red Sea. You saw a miracle. Isn't God able to do it? And you, you, you start, and, and a crowd gathers around you, and they're complaining, and, and they are angry, and they are sent back to Egypt. We've got to find a way back. And these people are angry. They're murmuring. They're complaining. It's three days after the Red Sea miracle. And you say, well, wait a minute. R remember when in Egypt you remember been hauling off barrel, wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow and cart after cart of dead frogs trying to clean up the stench and there wasn't a frog in your land? Don't you remember the locust? You, you could see that black cloud coming over the horizon and it passed you and it devoured everything in Egypt and there wasn't a locust in your land? What about those screams that night of the Passover the wailing and screaming, the firstborn of all cows and animals and, and children, the firstborn of every family, died in the middle of the night and you heard the wailing and the screaming. And not one of yours, not a dog died. Not a lamb died. 
Nothing died. And you're trying to pursue. They've forgotten all of that. And you, you, you say, well, see, look, the God that did all that, the God that opened the sea, you see those rocks up there? God can bring water out of one of those rocks. And everybody by now is laughing at you. Said, yeah, what's he going to do? Just take his rod and hit it? It's going to come out? And said, yes. And everybody's gathered around to see this crazy man talking about what God can do. He says, yeah, and I, I suppose you're going to tell us that God's just going to pour food out of heaven and we just go out and pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. They would think you're crazy. That you have lost your mind. They have seen all of this, but they don't believe it. There is absolute unbelief in their hearts. And you, you, you stand there and say, well, wait a minute. Has God changed in three days? Folks, you understand that every time God does a miracle for you, you know how long you remember it? If three days. Because you get in another mess, you get in another crisis and say, can God do it? Can God do it? We forget the miracles of God. We forget the blessing of God upon us and we get in a tight spot and we begin to murmur and complain once again. Then you point to the cloud that's hanging over the camp and you say, well, well what about that cloud? Why doesn't it evaporate? Why is it they're shielding you from the hot sun? Because you know you couldn't last one day in this desert. There's no man that's ever lived here. It's totally inhabitable, uninhabitable, and you cannot live here. Look at that cloud that never leaves you. And what about the glow at night that keeps you from being in pitch darkness so you can't even find your way around the camp and that soft glow over the camp? What about that? Well, that's, that's been there. I don't know where it comes from. They say it's God, but... but we're thirsty. You, you say to them, why don't you cast your care on him? Why don't you assure Moses that you believe the same God that did all these past miracles can do it for you again? You see, the Lord was trying to build a house. With Moses. He was trying to build a house. God chose a people that he would take into a wilderness and he would allow them to go through difficult, hard, impossible times where human, humanly thinking, according to the human mind, it would be absolutely impossible to survive. You could not have told anybody before this has happened that three million Jews can go into a wilderness where there is nothing but sand and and a hot blazing sun and serpents. And they would survive. And they would grow stronger in a wilderness. And God was going to test them. He tested them ten times, and ten times they failed the test. And if you've been there and say, around the waters of Mary, say, look, I want to tell you something. We, you know your God cares for you. He saw you in bondage in Egypt. He brought you out when you, you could not even make it. You were so tired and so weary. And by the way, folks, you know why God took away the straw? He knew that they're going to have a tough time. They're going to have to be able to walk a long way. They're going to have to have the muscle strengthened. So he took away the straw to build up their muscles. To give them strength. That's right. I believe that all my heart. He was preparing them for what was coming. But God wanted them to believe. So... How could even the elderly be so strong and go through that because they had been built up physically for this great task ahead of them? And you see, God was trying to build a house, a people who would trust him in all times, in all crises, in all things, and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God had a plan for this people. He wanted to take these people into the promised land. He wanted them to become evangelists for all history. He wanted uh, the word of God. The New Testament would have absolutely been a story, not of, of Hebrews 3, but it would have been a testimony 
for the whole world. It would have been a testimony of what God can do. God was working on a church. He's trying to build a people. They'll look at you and laugh and mock. Now, folks, can you imagine the joking of these people when, when have, you knew what God was going to do and you begin to tell them all the things that your almighty God can do and will do for them if they would just believe them? And not one of them would have listened to you. You know the rest of the story. Go to Psalm 78 and I'll show you the rest of the story on these people because of their unbelief. Psalm 78. Uh, <clears throat> Chapter 70, let's read, begin to read verse 13. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap. The day came also. He led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire. He claved the rocks in the wilderness. He gave them drink as out of the great dips. He brought streams also out of the rock, caused waters to run down like rivers. They sinned yet more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. They tempted God in their heart. By asking meat for the lust, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yes, he smote the rock, and the waters gushed out, the streams overflowed. But can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for the people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. They did not believe. This God says, I cannot work with this people. And the Bible Bible makes it very, very clear there and down in verse 29. So they did eat and were filled. He gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from the lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity. They're years in trouble. Folks, listen to me, please. These people flattered him with their lips. They said they worshipped him, but they never had a settled confidence in God's willingness and power to deliver them in a time of trouble. Folks, you're going to have to have, in the days ahead, a settled confidence. You're going to have to have a faith. This, this provokes God more than anything else. For a people to be kept, I, I can look back over all my years, my years and years of the faithfulness of God, I can look back over, as many of you in this church, most of you, all of you who walk in with God can say, God has never failed me, God has seen me through. And then, folks, that is the testimony upon which you build your faith for the future hard times that are coming. God who saw me through all these times is going to see me no matter what happens. My God will see me through. <clears throat> they limited God. Judgment fell on them in the wilderness. When they got to Kadesh, people gave up hope completely. This is the report of the spies and eight of those ten spies brought back an evil report. They're giants, they're high-walled cities. They're too strong for us. We're not able to go up against this people, for they're stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report, and all the congregation cried, and they wept that night. And the Lord saw this weeping people, and his anger was kindled against them. And he cried out to Moses, all of heaven cried like thunder. How long is it going to be before these people believe me for all the wonders that I've shown them? When will I find a people on the face of this earth that will believe me? Folks, if, if, if you go to Numbers, the 14th chapter, just quickly, please, the 14th chapter of Numbers, you get a little a good idea how what God thinks of his children when they indulge in unbelief.
Numbers 14, begin to read verse 26. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? Now, folks, he's calling them evil not for adultery, fornication, idolatry right now. He's calling them evil because they have no confidence in their father. No confidence in God. It's their unbelief. They, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the people of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you've spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Now, go to, chapter, uh, to verse 32. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your wardens. He said, your kids are going to have to put up with all of your talk. They're going to have to put up with your horrible example. Forty years and bear your wardens until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities, even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Verse 37, even those men that did bring up the report before the Lord, land died by the plague before the Lord. I believe those men died within the year. And, and folks, here's the tragedy of it. Here's, here's a whole young generation ha had to look at parents who were always down, always sad, always under fear, and always bound, not a day of joy. And folks, it was 40 years of funeral after funeral after funeral, one by one, two by two, dying. Thousands and thousands of funerals every year. It was nothing but death. And, and folks, I've seen Christian lives. Th th these are examples. These are types and shadows. There are many Christians, and their homes are just like that. There's a death, a pale of death that hangs over it. There is never any life. There's no joy. There's no happiness. Everything is wrong. Everything is out of order. Because there's no confidence in God. There's nothing but murmuring and complaining and doubt and fear. God doesn't take kindly to it. God says, all right, you're not going to believe me. I turn you over to your unbelief. God left them. They, he said, your carcass will die in your wilderness. And there are multiplied, multiplied numbers of Christians who, even now, some of you that are in this building, listening to me now, you're in a wilderness, a dry, empty wilderness. You have no joy. You never, you really don't know happiness. You don't know peace. Everything in your life goes wrong. Now, I'm not saying that, that everything that's wrong in your life is a result of unbelief. Sometimes, the Bible makes it very clear that the godly are, are tried. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. But God delivers them. One deliverance after another. He starts pulling you out and he restores your joy. I'm talking about people who don't even know what deliverance is about. People who live in constant dread. You just don't like to be around them. I mean, they pull you down. Folks, I have literally walked into homes... When, when we first came here, and, and occasionally when I've had to go to, to look for staff apartments, I could walk in, and sometimes I've had to walk in and walk out, because there's a spirit in that house. There is a spirit, there's a darkness, there's a demonic thing that hangs over the whole house. I, I know when somebody's into devil worship, when I walk in, immediately I can sense it. And there's some of you right now, your home is not a very loving place. There's a spirit in your home of darkness. And it's because of unbelief. It is unbelief. God sees. I don't care if you say a word. It's what God sees in your heart. When God... Gives Moses a notice that he's not going into the promised land. Go to Deuteronomy, which is the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy, if you will please. Deuteronomy 31. I consider this one of the most tragic 
sections in the portions in Scripture. Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. Verse 16, begin to read. The Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. He's telling them, your, your days are ended. You're coming to the end. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. This people will rise up and go warring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them. They'll forsake me and break my covenant, which I've made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, and that they have turned unto other gods. Now, look at me, please. You say, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. But Jesus is building a house in these last days, and in Hebrews, the third chapter, we have the same warning. We are warned explicitly and clearly, don't fall into the same sins of unbelief that the children of Israel fell into. That's what I've just read to you here in Hebrews, the third chapter. Peter said that you and I are living stones. And of these living stones, he's building a house. Where he, in which he can inhabit, where he, he finds pleasure, where he can live and enjoy our presence. He also, as living stones, would build up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God by Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it clear that there, there, there will be a people in these last days who absolutely live by faith. They are not going to have unbelief in them. They, they are going to be able to stand against any onslaught of the devil. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if everything and everybody around them fails. They're going to be so attached to Jesus, have their eyes focused on him, and their faith is going to be so settled and strong, his house is not going to fall. I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands. The, these who were washed with white, th those washed, these have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, he talks about multitudes, which no man could number. So there, there is going to be, according to the Scripture, a people, a redeemed people, who represent the house of Jesus Christ in the last days, who are not going to fall. But it is to this people, remember, it's to these who are now washing their robes, and those who are getting ready and preparing as a bride. These are the ones that the Holy Ghost comes to and says, today, if you will hear his voice, whose house you are, if you hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Then he adds this, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. I put a hard question to my soul when God was dealing with me in this message. I, I, I put a hard question to my heart. I said, God, I want you to examine my heart. Am I preaching this to others? And do you see any unbelief in me? Is there anything that is... Uh, Wounding your heart. Am I indulging? Am I slipping back occasionally into unbelief when, when I get into a difficult place and when things uh, pile up? Uh, Lord Jesus, are you satisfied with my confidence in you? Are you satisfied? I ask myself that hard question, and we're to examine ourselves in that area. You should do that even while I'm preaching. You should be doing that right now. Lord, do you see any unbelief in me? Have I been indulged? Have I been talking unbelief? Have I been sharing unbelief with other people? With my husband? With my wife? Am I going around saying why, why, why? And when, when, when? When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth? Evidently, there's going to be a lot of people fail. Could it be that you and I have taken our miracles for granted? 
I don't want to ever take a miracle for granted. I have a whole list I go over every time a, a bit of unbelief tries to invade my spirit. I, I start with Nikki Cruz. And I said, Lord, do you remember? And devil, do you remember? David, do you remember? How God took him and he's kept him all these years. And then I go over a whole list of young preachers all over the country that came out of drugs. And I remind my soul of the miracle. And then I, I start miracle after miracle. I, I talk about how this theater came to pass. And I talk about uh, Sarah House. I talk about Isaiah House. I talk about miracle after miracle. I talk about all my children serving the Lord. Children called to preach the gospel. I go over this list and say, Lord, these are miracles. And I keep building my confidence and faith in the Lord. I remember his goodness. Called counting your miracles. Uh, let's uh, switch this scene now. And let, let's, uh, in our, our minds now, take somebody that died and their carcass died in the wilderness and, and somehow we're able to bring him back. Let's bring back one of these unbelievers who died in the wilderness and unbelief. And he spends 30 days in New York City and I pick out 30 of your homes and send him to spend a day at your home. Because he's here for 30 days. And, and he sits in our services and now he doesn't know anything about this generation except what he sees and hears in the service and being with you in your home and, and listening to you and walking with you for 30 days. And then he comes to stand in his pulpit before he goes back to his grave. I wonder what he'd say. I think I know. We, we had God's law on two tablets, which we never touched. We saw them once and they were put away. We couldn't touch them. Two stones. You've got a word in a book that you handle, you touch daily. It's, it's inscribed in your very heart. And still you break it. It's a, yes, my generation disbelieved God. We provoked him. In the face of miracle after miracle, the guiding cloud, the silver trumpets, the fiery pillar at night. But you do worse than we did. Because you disbelieve in the face of infallible books of, of an infallible book of promises that is completed. We didn't have it. You have examples of history. And in the face of everything we did, he said, you've got my example. You read about it. Look what God did to us. You have that example, you have the example of all history, and more than that, you have an indwelling Holy Ghost that we didn't have. And even though you have the Holy Ghost in you telling you what is right and what is wrong, you still doubt him. Yes, we murmured in our tents and we doubted God in every time of trouble, but we only lived in the shadows. You lived in the, you live in the reality. We were just the type, you, you have the reality. It's written in your Bible, but now he, your Christ, hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more also he's a mediator of a better covenant established on better promises. You have a better covenant. You have better promises than we did. And you still don't believe. Yes, we flattered him with our mouths and we lied to him in our hearts. Yet you do worse. You, you assemble yourselves and you praise the Lord loudly. You shower him with flattering songs of worship. And what I've heard since I've been here, you retire to your homes. You permit doubts to flood your mind. He promised to keep you from falling, present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. Yet you don't fully believe that. Because if you believed that, I wouldn't have seen the unrest that I see in you. Some of you are not at rest, and yet you claim to believe his promises that he'll keep you from falling. We did not trust the Lord to take care of us. We didn't believe he truly loved us. We didn't believe that he would save our children. Time and again, he heard our cry when we were in trouble. He always delivered us, but we went right back to our old ways of unbelief. 
Our children saw us die and waste away, and they knew that we were dull and unhappy and miserable. They saw how hard our hearts were. And you have that example. You had it all told to you. You see it clearly, and yet you're just as guilty. I believe that, that he would he would have to leave this scene saying, I don't see anything different in this generation than in mine. And folks, here's what the Holy Ghost has been saying to me. And here's what I have to have. I want God to so lay it on my heart. I want it to so grip my soul that it, it's my life. It's a, I am set in it. I don't want to be one of those guilty of this sin of unbelief. In any area of my life, when it comes to any, any kind of battle in my flesh, I want to believe God's word that he says, I will deliver you through the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to believe that. Whether I see it or not, I'm going to believe it until it happens, until it comes. I'm not going to try to work it out myself. I'm not trying to get in the flesh and try through my human power to try to make something happen. When God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, I want to stand still. When God says, cast your care upon me for I care on you, I'm going to cast my care upon him and not pick it up again. When God says, I'll supply all your needs, I'm not going to sit up half the night worrying about how he's going to do it. God said it, I'm going to accept it and believe it. <laughs> Folks, this house is not going to waste away in the wilderness. It's not going to have a bunch of dead carcasses. God's going to have a people that he's going to take into hard times. Folks, we are going into a wilderness. There's no question about it. We are going into our testing times. In fact, that's mostly what my message is about, how God, though this, this is going to be judgment on the wicked at the same time, it's a testing time for the church of Jesus Christ. He's going to purge his church in these hard times, and out of it he's going to raise up a people. It's not going to be a great host. It's going to be a holy remnant. It's going to be a people that have the greatest testimony that anybody can have. Then in a time of panic, you have that calm, quiet rest in God that nothing moves you, nothing hurts you. Because once you die to this world, how can you hurt a dead man? How can you hurt somebody that's dead to this world? If you're dead to the world and the things of this world, you could lose everything that you have and not be touched. You see, in this house we have a high priest. Hallelujah. We have a perfect high priest who's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'm going to close shortly, but I want you to see this. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Fourth chapter of Hebrews, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, which is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeding of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Folks, hallelujah, in these trying days that are coming, don't forget you have a high priest who's been touched with everything that you could go possibly consider, conceive and go through. He's been there. He's been through it. He's been through poverty. He's been through hunger. He's been through the loss of all things. He, he has been there, and he's touched with all of our feelings, some of you feeling just a little weary because of the battle in your home or your job or whatever it may be. Some of you being harassed on your job. But the most important thing is that you don't allow the enemy to come in with unbelief and fear and dread. He's touched with the feelings of your infirmity. He knows exactly what you're going through. 
I don't want it said of me, how long shall I put up with this evil? Those who murmur against me, how long will it be before I find a people that will trust me? This uh, past, I think it was November, last November, a few months ago, God really began to deal with me. He he was beginning to to move in my heart uh, about what is coming. And I want you to know, friends, that I set my heart. You can ask my wife. I'm not boasting, but in the Lord. Nothing to do with human power, human flesh, or anything else. But I set my mind. I'm going to seek God with everything in me, and I am not turning back. I'm going to lay hold of God until he touches my life in a new and fresh and living way. Lord, you can prophesy through me. You do what you want. Lord, I laid down everything I have and all that I am at your altar. Lord, I want to die to this world and everything that's in this world. And when you come to that place, when you come, and folks, it's something you have to do every day. You go to God, whether you pray whether you feel like praying or not. You go to God and you stay there till you break through. You go to God and say, I'm in no hurry, Lord. I'm staying here till you speak to my heart. He'll speak to you every single day. He'll speak to you. He'll encourage you. And then you get into the word of God every day and start building your faith because faith comes from this book right now. Not just reading scripture, but hearing it. And I, here's my argument with the Lord. said, Jesus, you couldn't do anything without your father. You could do nothing and you were the son of the living God. How do you expect me to do anything? Lord, how do you ever expect me to stand up and preach unless you tell me what you want me to preach? How can I do anything unless you show me from the heavenly father? Lord, I want what you have. And he wants to do that for every one of his children. He wants you to be totally dependent on him. Not on the government, not on your job, not on your pastors, but on Jesus Christ himself. Will you stand, please? Hallelujah, I believe God. I believe God. You'll be tested on that. Oh, yeah, I'm tested on it, but hallelujah. Bring every thought of unbelief into captivity to the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. And they that come to him must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Heavenly Father, I I couldn't physically face what I believe is coming if you didn't put faith in my heart. And Lord, you've got to do that for your house. You said you're building a house. You're building a people. We are living stones, and you're using these stones to build your house. But these stones, every one of them, cry out. These stones cry out, I trust in God. I trust in God. He will not fail me. I come against the spirit of unbelief, doubt, and fear in Jesus' name. If you've been plagued with unbelief, if you have to repent for unbelief, if, if your unbelief has caused you to be angry at God and you, you say, well, I've, I've prayed and I don't see the answers. Folks, when you keep saying that, I've prayed and I don't see the answers, that's just unbelief. Pure and simple, it's unbelief. Leave the timing alone. There's a Holy Ghost timing. God knows when and how to do it. Say, Lord, I believe that the righteous prayers of the righteous men are heard. And we know if he hears us, we have the petition. So I just rest and wait. Folks, you don't even have to look for the answer. Just start loving Jesus with all your heart and, and, and let him be your joy and your strength. And, and, and it suddenly one day it happens, it's there, it just happens naturally, it's there suddenly. You turn around and say, he answered it, there it is. It's, it's just the normal 
everyday thing. It's, it's, it's not some big supernatural thing. And suddenly it's just there. It's happened. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. It's like, like my, my, my good friend who, who wrote, uh, they speak with tongues, John Sherrill, and he helped me with the book, Cross and Switchblade. He became an alcoholic. And, uh, while he was writing religious books, and he prayed and prayed and fasted, just laid hold of God. And he, he just, he just didn't uh, look for any big miraculous thing. But one day, he, he said, David, I, I took a walk along this line. And he said, I realized that I hadn't had a drink in a few days. And so I realized it was gone. It was just a normal thing. It just happened. God didn't come and just hit him and throw him down into the power and say, get up, you're healed. Folks, God's got a million ways to do it. Just leave it to him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Balcony in the main floor, if there's unbelief in your heart. If you've been going through a, a shattering experience, I want you to come and believe God as you stand at this altar, that there will be deliverance for you. Come now as even I uh, will speak. I'm going to sing. If you're backslidden, if you've grown cold toward the Lord, if you're not right with God, if you don't know Jesus, come and join these that are coming. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side. Lord bless you. We're going to pray for you and believe God right now to bring you into a, to a place of faith, simple childlike faith in the Lord, that your life would be pleasing to him. Your life cannot be pleasing to him without that faith. For without faith, you cannot please him. To have a pleasing heart, a pleasing life to the Lord, the unbelief has to go. The doubts and the fears have to be given up to him, surrendered to him. Come, as they sing. My eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. He made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved, and he that keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. He's your shade. On the right hand, the sun will not smite you, the moon by night either. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth even forevermore. The Lord said, I'm your keeper. I'm your shield. I'm your son. I'm all that you need. Trust in me. Trust in me. Would, would you pray this, pray this from the innermost part of your being right now? Just pray this with everything in your heart. Dear Jesus, forgive my unbelief. I see now what a horrible sin it is. How it breaks your heart. I want my life and my walk with you to be pleasing to you, Lord. So forgive me and cleanse me. I repent of my doubts and of my unbelief. Lord, I've doubted you when you were testing me.